Nam mô Sakya Munai Buddhaya Dear Thầy Dear Sangha Nói chú dặn nhỏ nhỏ xuống chút chị nghe lớn quá Cảm ơn xem If, if possible I'm looking at the clock And I see that it's 10.30 Chú có một người ta thấy mặt sư cô Không hỏi And we are in the, the ocean of peace meditation hall right now. And before I came up here, I was aware that the Dharma talk will start late. We're sorry that we are late. And that our lay friends online They have to be waiting there. But when that thought arose, I had to smile and let go. Because if I do not let go of it, then my mind is not empty and light. And we are practitioners practice we practice mindfulness we practice coming back to our breath with mindfulness and we practice uh, coming back to take refuge in our own island so when i'm sitting here i continue to follow to recognize my in breath and my in our breath and i keep saying to myself amazing like we have a chiropractor being here with us these past few weeks and the doctor always said amazing to everything and so now my mind also gives rise to that thought amazing to have a chance to come back to my breathing, to come back to the moment, to allow our thoughts to be released. And there's only one thought, amazing, that will dwell in my mind. Yesterday, after uh, having been away for a week, and I look at that the <laughs> part of flowers called Kam Jung, and it died. When I saw that it died, I regretted it. But I, I also looked into the reasons why it died. And so I trimmed it, I cut it down, and I looked at the soil. It was very dry and hardened, like a block of uh, rock. And so I asked myself, the soil is hardened dry and hardened like that how is my own mind the the land of my mind because many times our teacher taught that as practitioners we must cultivate and plow the mind the land of our mind the soil of our mind and when i look at the dry arid land in the far apart I had to stop and ask myself, what is uh, the state of uh, being of my own land? So it brought me a lot of joy because before that, I, I also read a calligraphy book uh, with all of our teachers' calligraphies. And there was a line, Thay wrote, what have I done with my life? Thay wrote that, what have I done with my life? So these are like koans that give me a chance to reflect, to understand myself better. And well, so these past days, as I reflect upon myself, I would like to ask permission today to share with you what I have gone through during the most recent time and the experiences 
uh, like direct experiences, the fruits, the, the insight, the learning, the lessons that I have gained. I would like to share them with you. And to begin, I invite the Sangha to breathe with sound one sound the bell so that your mind can be very calm and light. And you can also ask yourself, what is the land of your mind? Uh, what, how, what is it right, like right now? And what have you done? What have, have I done with my life? Looking down, I see Brother Fatbo waving at me. Uh, his name means Dharma Rain. I have beautiful brothers and sisters. When I talk about plowing the, the soil or the land of my our mind, the, I remember what Thay has taught us in order to nourish our beginner's mind. We have to use the plow of mindfulness. Mindfulness is likened to a plow. There are, there are plows, the, the blade has to be small and sharp in order to go deeply into the earth and to up, cut the roots. And so that the soil can be softened uh, so that air can enter and, and to have enough true nutrients for, for the trees. And as I reflect, I see that sometimes our life in the monastery, after a while, our views can be closed. So there may be, they be, may become narrow, can have a, a trip is an opportunity. Each interaction is an opportunity. When we meet our co-practitioners, it's an opportunity. So our recent trip, the two of us, two sisters went, uh, went to Hawaii to help lead, um, a conference. We had a few sessions uh, doing uh, a, a Salesforce conference about a hundred, uh, we can call them uh, very successful businessmen, CEO uh, from middle class, higher class with higher education, um, with very, and I, I wanted to go because I've lived in the US more than 30 years, but I've never been to Hawaii. And I thought to myself, it sh should be very interesting going there. But now as I look back, uh, what's interesting to me is actually different from what I had anticipated. If you don't mind, I'll share with you briefly about my experience. So I went with my elder sister, Sister Dang Yim, Sister D, and I know that when we go out, we represent the Sangha. We bring our teacher with in our every breath and every step, we carry the Sangha with us. And we walk with the protection of the of mindful manners and of uh, the precepts uh, with the uh, the energy of mindfulness. So we have to be highly aware, more so than when we are staying in the monastery. And it was because of that, that during the seven days that we were there, I did not have the thought that, oh, we go there to just, you know, enjoy the scenery. 
to play. I saw very clearly, I, re I came back to being a, a novice uh, with my eyes open wide to sit still, to learn, to listen to my sisters uh, uh, guiding the, the participants in the conference. So I became all new again to come back to my every breath and to know the breath is an in-breath, to know that is an out-breath, to know the position of my sitting, to know that my face, there's relaxation, there's happiness, and to be aware that even though people have many degrees, their diplomas, that those of them who are millionaires and billionaires, there, there are those who are very like young and beautiful, there, and which, but all of them, regardless of their background and their success, they all have a need for a spiritual dimension. And that is why we as monastics, we go there to be a part of it. And even Mark, as the founder of Salesforce, he loves our teacher of Plum Village. He loves our teacher, he respects our teacher. And so that's why he has been inviting his uh, Thai students to come to his conferences uh, to invite the engaged Buddhism uh, to be a part of his business culture. And when I sat there, I look at everybody, everything, everybody was sitting very still, peacefully, and I was very happy. And I knew right away, right in that moment, the mind of my, my, of my land, uh, the land of my mind uh, was cultivated, was nourished. It was uh, in touch with the sincerity uh, of the people there. Even though they were wealthy and powerful, they still needed the powerful spiritual uh, the spiritual dimension in their life. And so then I asked myself, here I am, even though I had listened to uh, num Dharma talks numerous times, I myself have guided many people, but right in that moment, my mind has to be new. It has to be the mind of a novice, novice monk, a novice nun, to come back to my own breath and to be still and to be open to every everything. And those days, I learned that Mark Benioff, he said this, even though he was successful, he's a billionaire, but he said, I wrote it down here. I don't, you can have an expected mind, a fixed mindset where you have only a few possibilities or you can have a beginner's mind where you always have every possibility. Mark Benioff. So to my general understanding, he says that you can have a mind that is set, that is fixed, uh, closed off, then you only have a few possibilities open to them, uh, open to you. You only see a few possibilities. But if your mind is open, is uh, it's, it's a beginner's mind, then you see innumerable possibilities. They are all open to you. And when I heard that statement, I learned. As a practitioner, how many times a day do I allow myself to have a beginner's mind? How many times a day do I allow myself to have a new view, a view of us? I, I, why, when I look at my older siblings and younger 
brothers and sisters, dear friends, I cannot do that a lot. Sometimes we take for granted, we, uh, and, or sometimes we just simply forget. But it is when we are aware, when we go outside and we see people who can be so successful in certain aspects of their life, and they can look uh, they, that they can be so positive, they have a way of keeping their mind open and new like that, then I see that I need to relearn. And it is my relearning. I discover many wonderful things. I learn from the lava in Hawaii uh, because of the uh, volcanoes. We have lava flowing down and it's hardened everywhere. And it's uh, widespread on the land. On the land. And I, I, my first thought was, oh, Hawaii is so strange. There's all this black rock. That was the, my first impression. But once I arrived, I saw that next to the lava, the lava, then there was the, you know, even like it flows into the ocean. Even in the ocean, they are also active. Uh, near the ocean, there are active vol volcanoes. But they're always, you know, the waves and they're always these coconut trees, uh, very healthy and very lush. And there are people there who are so positive, who are so pleasant, who are so open-minded. And after of our sessions uh, were at the conference, there were people, young people, uh, and there were also older people who were very successful. They came up to us and they, uh, there was someone, someone said, do you know, at the first session, I only needed to look at the two of you stepping down, stepping down the van. It was like electricity running down my own body. I felt this, I, I was so deeply moved just looking at you stepping down the van. There were those who said they were so moved they use words that we know that came from their own hearts because they were able to touch the beauty, the wholesomeness, and the truth of the Dharma. And so when I, I my own, the, the eye of my mind was also open. And I saw how important it is that we practice and that we can offer to people um, a, a direction of wholesomeness, of truth, so that people can walk on it. Can, can, and, and that I, I make this vow to strengthen that confidence, that faith in myself, first and foremost. There are so many wonderful things. During the time, we xem ra chào họ một tiếng giận họ. Yeah. We also met a uh, a doctor from UCSF, Doctor Larry, brilliant, and he, for the most part of his life, he has done many important works. He actually helped and. Uh, smallpox and that it, it actually was it was actually eradicated with uh, his work with uh, uh, World Health Organization so there are people who who have done important work they reach their hands reach out uh, to different corners of the world to help people our hearts have to be open so that we can learn from these uh, mirrors. They, this doctor we met, he was very simple, even though he has all these degrees, even though he's a millionaire, but his simplicity, uh, his, his uh, humility, uh, that really, really moved us.
as when I when I was with, um, in interacting with him, I felt like he was my own uncle. And he said to me, "Bamboo float," because my name is Bamboo. And uh, and right in that present moment, my mind was open and light. It was. It became his statement. Uh, became a. a Koan for me. Yes, the bamboo floats because it's like I'm sister bamboo. Uh, if I can make my mind uh, empty so that I can float above the the afflictions, the um, irritation, the uh, complaint, I have to learn. I looked at the the coconut trees and the leaves. The leaves are. Uh, uh, sway in the wind uh, throughout the day, but the trees, they survive, uh, they withstand the wind and the storms because the, the coconut leaves space out and they are very flexible, malleable, and because they, the leaves are in all directions. And so when the wind blows then it can sway and it has very deep roots to keep it and so i ask myself am i able to 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 be like the, a coconut tree with deep roots and with the leaves spaced out and with the flexibility that can withstand the wind so in moments um our teacher you know there uh, when I when there are difficulties like the wind, the, the storms in the ocean, the, a coconut tree can stand there, withstand for 10 years, 20 years as a practitioner. Am I able to do that? And if my mind is not empty and spacious, then even small wind can also cause, can so can cause the, the strong wavering, um, just like a small bowl of soup. There's a storm in a small bowl of soup instead of strong storms in an ocean. I invite the Sangha to breathe with the sound of the bell so that we can learn. Learn about nature. You in me? Breathe with the wholesomeness, with the beauty in us and all around us. Yesterday, I asked my young sister to print out this for me. This is the word patience. Nhận means patience. I don't know much about uh, the Chinese character. Actually, I don't know anything. <laughs> but I remember before I became a nun, my, my young sister gave me a calligraphy. It's very beautiful, like this. And my young sister, my biological sister, she, she said to me, a nun gave me that word. Go down. It's, up there is actually that the upper character is the knife. Dao is the knife with a with a a, a cross over it, and then down the lower character is of the mind of the heart. So when the word patience or forbearance, it means that what you. When there's like a knife that wants to, you know, to stab in your own heart, and yet you can hold it, you can withhold it. It's 
and that's what is meant. It's meant by patience or forbearance. When I listened to that explan explanation, I wasn't satisfied with it yet. But then I I follow our teacher, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. Then I ordained with him, and of course, as a student, <laughs> naturally we admire our teacher. I don't want to always praise our teacher, but truly, I learn everything about our everything from our teacher. Each his work, his poetry, his teaching. I'm just so happy. Uh, to have a chance to listen to our tape, to learn from him, to be reminded from him. And he taught that patience means to forbear. Patience, sometimes we think it's mean, it, it means like we are patient or we, we accept something. But if we understand, uh, more deeply and with the, the wisdom of the old people. We, but the word in Vietnamese is kiểu đẳng. There are two words. Kiểu means to agree or you bear it, you, you accept it. Kiểu also means it's okay, an agreement. We don't expect more. At, things to be our own way. It comes from our understanding, our knowing that you, it comes from stopping, stopping the practice of stopping in each of our breath, in each step we practice stopping so that our mind can be empty and new. Only then that you, that they can be deep and long, but you, if we say like you, you you bear it and you have to suppress something in you. You bite on you bite your teeth and, and bear something. Then after a while you will explode or implode. So the word kiểu here it it takes the length of practice. It comes from your own understanding and love when you can accept and forbear. It doesn't mean that. Yes, I know that person is like that. That person behaves like that. The situation is like that. And yet I can embrace it. I can, I can hold it. But the word đừng, it means to contain, to con, yeah, đừng means to contain, to embrace something that you, it's like your heart, the volume, the volume of your heart, how much can you hold? You can you embrace? So the word kiểu đẳng to stand for this word we we translate as forbearance or patience. So when I was in Hawaii, I saw the original people there. They they make when they make the canoe, they use a very big tree and they carve the inside so that is empty, empty. They remove the wood and they just use the the, the outside so that to can to make a canoe a boat is to empty the inside to create this space so that it can carry people can carry goods and that it can travel on the ocean and to transport only then can it it can hold because it is empty that is able to hold and transport and so the the wisdom in the word kiudeng it can also it it teaches us that we need to empty ourselves so that we our capacity to hold becomes greater than our patience of our par our for parents forbearance would have a strength. Otherwise, it's our patience is only to attain something, or there's an aim to it. And the the Buddha also taught his own son Rahula, Rahula, you have to learn to be patient and for forbearing like the earth with all the, the impurity that is poor on the earth, whether it's a, a cologne fragrance or it's toxic materials or uh, urine or feces, the earth accepts all of that. And some substances will take like trash that we put into the earth 
with plastic 200, 300 years, they are still not yet disposable, uh, disintegrate yet. And we bring so much trash and dump in other poor, poor countries. And even when we want to bring trash to empty, to put in, in space. And so therefore this trash that we have accumulated and dumped in other spaces, we see that Mother Earth has this great capacity for patience and for, for parents. But the Buddha also taught his son Rahula, the young monk, you have to learn the virtue of patience and for parent, parents, like the water. When the water cannot go straight, uh, there's an obstacle in front of it, then the water will go around the obstacle around the rock or underneath or to will uh, search at another time. So the patience of the water, the water can cleanse all things without water. We would not be clean like this. Our bodies would not exist. And water gives us this life. And the Buddha also taught Rahula, the young monk Rahula, we also need to learn through the patience and forbearance of the fire. The fire also works silently there to, to melt iron, to, to consume uh, all the impurity. The, the fire can has no uh, hesitation. And the Buddha also taught Rahula that you need to learn the virtue of the wind or the different smells, fragrance, or um, when it's impugnant, that the wind will always bring the new, new fresh air for us. And the wind has no hesitation, uh, no reluctance. The, the wind from the four directions. And so nature gives us, the, the cosmos gives us these beautiful virtues, exemplify these beautiful virtues. So in order to have a new mind, a growth mind, a mind that, a mind of wholesomeness, of, of beauty, of truth, then in our daily practice as, as monastics, as lay friends who practice mindfulness, we need to have more, to cultivate more virtues such as patience, virtue, uh, forbearance, diligence, uh, so that we can care better for our own mind, the land of our mind. This. I recall when I went with my older sister to Hawaii. Uh, we are nuns. So morning after noon and evening, we wear only one color. And we were in a world, uh, we were amongst uh, very wealthy people. So they would wear the most beautiful clothing there. There were af uh, afternoons and evenings when we walked through the resort, the resort and we, we passed by these, um, these dinings, uh, outdoor dinings, and now these tables with a tablecloth, beautiful uh, tablecloth. And the two of us just did walking meditation, just like we were walking in the, uh, on the monastery grounds. And I, I, just con I just kept walking with peace and with happiness and with freedom. And I, I, I did not feel any of my steps that I felt uh, awkward or confused. I was happy to walk, even though around me there were so many people who came from a different world than mine. I smiled with myself, and I know that 
we will we will have a great precepts uh, transmission ceremony uh, in October. I, and I looked at the waves and I thought to myself, perhaps in that moment, I already crossed because the theme of our great ordination ceremony is go to the other shore, go into the other shore. And I felt, oh, in this moment, I, I am crossing to the other shore. I remember when, or before I, in 1995 or something, I, I, my, I became a widow, 1980 something, I became a widow and uh, my son um, lost his father when he was only seven and, or eight years old. But a few years later, he, he went to college and then he, he received an award in college and, uh, it, it, and the, the ceremony was taking place in a very luxurious place and the parents had to pay, that was in 1999, we had to pay $300 to, to have a seat there. I said, no, I won't pay for that. I work, I work hard I, until nine o'clock. Uh, at, in the evening, I said to my son, I will park in front of that, uh, of that hotel. And so, so I, I was there uh, until 10 at night waiting in the parking uh, lot. And I saw even the, the attendants outside, they dress in beautiful uh, uniforms. And, and I remember I did feel a little bad because my car was so old. I did not dare to park in front uh, near the, the, the hotel. I had to park uh, at a far away place and turn off the lights because I was aware that even if you park a car and I didn't even dare to park my car. I didn't dare to be near that world. And I had that kind of complex uh, being, you know, not, not coming from that uh, world. And from afar, as I was sitting in the car waiting for my son to walk out and here he was in a very nice suit. And that was the first time I dare to spend $300, three, $400 to buy uh, a suit for him like that. And my best clothing cost only $20, $30. And I felt my son was realizing my dream. This is the mind of many mothers. Uh, you know, we may be poor and we have many dreams and we have many wishes, but 21 years later, here, I was a nun, and when my elder sister and I passed by the place of very rich and powerful people, and they were dining, they were sitting there, whatever that was most beautiful and fancy for them, they, they had it on, and yet here they were, and <laughs> the two of us just had our brown robes, brown clothing on, and we're even poorer now than 21 years before because now our, we really don't, back then we even, we actually had a car or some sort, but now we had empty hands and yet we were taking such peaceful, steady, stable steps and they were very powerful steps. And a few days ago, a few days later, when I came uh, back to the monastery, I told a younger sister, do you know that our uh, teacher, the Buddha, gave us this brown robe? It's so quiet, it's so simple and humble, and yet it's so powerful. We wear, we put it on, but we have this power, power of the one who can cultivate the energy of mindfulness. It is powerful because of the way we walk, the way the, we sit, the way we talk. There is carefulness, there is awareness, there is precepts, there are precepts, there are mindful manners. And I feel completely satisfied. I don't have any kind of complex, like I am better or lower or, or equal to anybody in those moments. 
And so in those moments, once again, my mind was cultivated, was nourished, and I could, I have a chance to enliven my, my beginner's mind. And actually, when I said to my younger sister, and then the, I, I met uh, our aspirant, and I said to her, can you let me borrow the book Stepping Into Freedom? Are used for the use for aspirants and novices. So I feel I get to be a novice again, to step into like an, a new person stepping to the the great threshold. Uh, open the, the 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 space is wide open. The space outside of space. When our mind is sincere yearning to strive to to reach the 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 the, the greater space and poetic like our teacher he called it space outside of space and in the dhammapada also used that uh, the the first chapter space outside of space the buddha taught the buddha taught that patience for parents is the first virtue and nirvana is the ultimate. To be able to have that, it is not something that will give you from the outside, but it is inside of us in order to overcome, to transcend our fear, our complexes, the fear of being less than others, being more than others, being equal to others, the fear of being jealous, uh, being envied by others, or the fear of... Uh, being insecure, the fear that then it causes us to withdraw, to contract, and we do not dare to engage, to, to do things. So the Buddha taught us that the forbear forbearance and patience is the first virtue. We have to learn this virtue so that in our daily life, every breath, every step in mindfulness, we cultivate that virtue so that so that we have a new mind, a beginner's mind to confront situations that arise. And if we are not patient like that, then it would be very difficult to go through life. Like people in the world, uh, if we do not have forbearance and patience, and if we cannot come back to our mindful breathing with our awareness of our breathing, and if we cannot practice stopping with the sounds of the bell, with our tele, with the telephone, so that we can stop right in the moment, in the here and the now. Then we know that our spouse, or our partner, or our father, or mother, or children, they are saying things, certain things that can be very triggering. That can, may perhaps they are being upset, angry, and if we cannot forbear, we cannot be patient, then everything will be, will explode. And then, and everything, uh, we may say something or do something that will hurt everybody. And so what's most important to me, I'm still up to this moment, I still try, uh, I still try to cultivate that I need to learn to be patient with my own practice to be patient with my own monastic brothers and sisters and to be patient with the things that we are not so pleased with. And we know that everybody wants to do the right thing, the good thing, the wholesome thing. Even people who are, who are rich and powerful, they still yearn to do, go in the wholesome and beautiful way and they want to cultivate more of that. Then why we, as practitioners, we can we cannot release the small things um, so that we can. Uh, there are people who are out there who do many good things to bring v vaccines to poor countries to help people who are going going through war right now, like the country Afghanistan. The people just like our we Vietnamese went through in 1975. If we do not practice, we do not learn 
to love and to understand, then we cannot see that the pain of people, the, the, the Afghanistan people going through right now, it's just like the pain of the Vietnamese people who went through the fall of Saigon 40 years ago. So suffering is being repeated. Life, suffering, the life is it's like the lava that is, that is pouring out and is hardened. It's hardened, and yet next to that, there are still coconut trees that are, you know, that are reaching the sky and healthy and swaying in the wind. And there's still the fresh wind blowing from the ocean. There's still, and we we can still be aware that we have so many conditions of happiness, so that we don't have to only complain and to to, to as a person as a mother in a family, as a housewife or somebody who takes care of, of, uh, of the children of the household, um, whether you are mothers or fathers or uh, all of us, we have to have that patience and forbearance. We need the stillness so that we can lead, guide the direction of the family, of the relationship. Uh, I like to see movies about princess and uh, and prince, uh, princes and princesses, and I admire uh, the Queen of England. She has been the queen uh, for seventy years in England, and one of her virtues is no complain and no explain. She doesn't complain. She doesn't reproach. That's her practice. She look and observe, observes. I ask myself, can I do some a little bit of that so that I don't keep complaining and reproaching? Just do my my part, and then other people they have to do their part. I cannot practice. I cannot share in uh, in English. Then I sat there and listened to my sister sharing to the friends at the conference. I, I sat there and be present and listen. And I was there as a beginner to learn, to listen, and to learn. And it was a great joy. If you cannot do something, you have to be happy to see other people do it and not have a complex and complain about it. So then we learn to have, we learn to be able to see the situation, accept it and embrace and contain it as it is. And so I have learned many lessons from the trip. So the last three weeks uh, in our Clarity Hamlet, we have um, uh, an acupuncturist, uh, her name is Megan, and we have an, a chiropractor doctor, uh, Anna, and they came and they gave wonderful treatment to our brothers and sisters the past three weeks. So they stay with us. And, uh, and so yesterday, some of us sat with Dr. Anna and we asked her, what, 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 what makes you like to come to stay with us? Because just last year you were there in Vietnam and treating our Thai, you were there for over nine months. And you treated not just the Thai, our teacher and the brothers and sisters and their parents and the lay friends who came. And we asked her, you know, just right after that big trip, she came here and stay with us. And she not, does not only take care of us, treat our bones and our body, but I also feel that she helps us heal our mind as well with her presence and with her open heart. Because there is something very holy and noble about her. She's so fresh. Sometimes I see myself, I'm not so fresh like her. I can say, I'm grumpy, <laughs> complaining, frowning, complaining. And uh, the very most venerable, uh, Aja Brahm, and he wrote a book, Be wor Don't Worry, Be, don't, be Worry, Be Grumpy. And I said, you know, you, I look at the olives, the dry olives. It's like when we are like that, then we lose our path. 
Olusa. But I look at Dr. Anna, her face is so fresh, she's always smiling. And I, so I ask her, you like to come see brothers and sisters, but we speak Vietnamese and you speak English. Isn't that difficult for you? And she said, that's not a problem. I, she loves with the end, she lives with the energy of love and she is fresh. And one of the, another thing I learned from her is to keep saying amazing. Can we in our daily life, can I in my, in my daily life, how many times a day do I have a mind that looks everything with happiness and praise others and accept others? Amazing. Or do I have jealousy or do I am not pleased with what's happening or it's not my idea, so I pushed other people's idea away. So today as I share these things that I have gone through and I've learned during the recent um, few weeks and I see that everything is a lesson for me. Everything helps me to see myself more clearly, uh, to remind me. And I, I remind myself, let us, let, let, let's be a novice again. It means to stop, and the means to learn. Uh, we learn the virtue of love. We learn to practice stopping. We so that our love can grow. We can be uh, diligent uh, in our practice, in our training. We need to be reminded, and when I'm reminded, I should not re react because we do not dare to remind each other anymore as we become elder in the practice. If, even if we remind others, don't want to accept, don't want to listen. Uh, and so then we also learn to learn to, to be novices again, to want to be reminded, to want to learn, uh, to, to calm down the waves outside, they come and go, but the quietness, the stillness in us, we need to be in touch with and cultivate more and more. So dear Sangha, these are the things that I have learned from the earth, from the water, from the wind that I have learned from the fire. And these are the things that I want to cultivate, to plow. And these are the things that I want to learn according to the virtue, virtues of those people who do great things out there in the world, but in a silent way. They don't have expectation. Just like Kennedy, President Kennedy, don't ask what the country can do for you, but ask what you can do for this country. No, we don't ask, what can the Sangha do for me? But we ask ourselves, what can I do for the Sangha? And for the boat, we ask, am I a piece of wood, uh, to, to fit in, to make this boat of the, the to make this Sangha boat, boat, to keep the Sangha boat floating. I, I make the vow to do this very ordinary common work. And yet it's not easy, but I will keep trying because I have good faith. Because I know people out there, they have faith and confidence in wholesomeness, in truth, in beauty. Then the Buddha has given us this 2,600 years. The Buddha and Thay gives us this brown color of simplicity, of quietness, of forbearance and patience. We can do that. I can do that. Thank you so much for listening.